the vibration is just like one particular mo like oh, mode. Each so mode, yeah. So like even like translational and rotational modes, or is there like some kind of scattering for those? Yes. Uh, it's a matter of personal choice. Some people call that rotational Raman. Okay, okay so you can call it rotational Raman scattering. Uh, if the rotations, if they bump into each other while they're rotating, they call it librations. And then you call it stimulated librational scattering. Yeah, so, so uh, yes, yeah, so, but that's the degree of freedom. So li librations are damped rotations. Uh, it gets to a point where it's no longer fun anymore to, 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 uh, uh, to consider all these different possibilities. Okay. Other discussion? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a monastery. I was thinking I am like the Dalai Lama, and you're the monks who are in my, uh, my monastery. And every morning, the uh, you're from that part of the world, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But maybe not Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Every morning, the uh, uh, the, the uh, head the head of the abbey comes out and says, chants, "Good morning," and all hundred monks say, "Good morning," and every evening. Uh, he uh, says, good evening. They say, good evening. Uh, but then one of his monks, he sent him away to go to an optical society meeting <laughs> in, in North America. And the monk comes back. He's terribly, terribly jet lagged. And uh, the next morning, the, uh, the Dalai Lama says, good morning. And 99 monks say, good morning, and one of them chants, good evening. And then the Dalai Lama says, someone chanted evening. <laughs> Isn't that a great song? No. <laughs> but it's better than hearing me lecture, right? <laughs> OK, so uh, how many of you have seen South Pacific? How many of you seen South Pacific? I guess it only works for my age group. Some Enchanted Evening is, is the, one of the key songs from this Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. Ah, OK. But if you never heard the song, you're not going to get the joke, are you? Everybody my age gets it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so the summary up to this point is that uh, the Stokes is amplified, and the anti-Stokes is attenuated. But what happens if you actually go to the laboratory and do the experiment? So let's say you take your Raman medium and you take your laser beam and what you find is that in almost all directions Stokes light is emitted except that if you look in the near forward direction, so you put a screen here in the near forward direction, and you will find two very thin rings of light with a dark spot between them. So of course, this is a contrast reversal. Uh, that's why you should use chalkboards, right? It's a black, it's a black and then the white appears uh, against it. So there's a dark spot, and each of these two lines 
contains both Stokes and anti-Stokes. So uh, obviously there is a mechanism to create intense anti-Stokes radiation, even though the theory that we've developed up to this point says that anti-Stokes light should not be generated. In fact, there's a nonlinear attenuation process that would influence it. So we go back to that equation we had before. I said there are four cross terms. We've looked at two of them. Now the cross term that we haven't looked at yet is one that says that there is a, a polarization at the anti-Stokes frequency that is given by epsilon zero n partial alpha with respect to x zero a laser Q of omega. So of course this will be at the anti-Stokes frequency because it will be at a laser, omega laser plus a vibrational frequency. So this term we haven't looked at yet. Uh, so uh, what it turns out to be is N over 2m partial alpha with respect to x squared, probably with an epsilon 0 squared, a laser squared, a Stokes star, e to the i twice k laser minus k Stokes times z over omega v squared minus omega, let's call omega squared for now, uh, minus i omega gamma. And let's choose to write this as 3 epsilon 0 chi f at omega a, a laser squared, a Stokes star, e to the i twice k laser minus k Stokes times z. Y F. F is for four wave mixing because this contribution is a four wave mixing contribution. Two laser photons and one Stokes photon interact to produce an anti Stokes photon. And if you like to see how the energy works out, it's a process where a laser and a Stokes and a laser produces an anti-Stokes. So let's see, this is a real level, this is a virtual level, this is a virtual level, omega laser, omega Stokes, omega laser, omega anti-Stokes. Okay, so it, it looks just like a four-wave mixing process. And of course, it needs to be phase matched. Which, I mean, this is the key sign here that this needs to be phase matched uh, because the, uh, there's a complicated wave vector dependence of, of the nonlinear polarization. Um, in your second equation, where you put partial of alpha with respect to x, yes. is that the partial of alpha with respect to x at zero? All. I put the zero in the wrong place. That's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. yeah. At e zero just means equilibrium here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, so that's the term that we had left out. And now I will.
So this means that I can, here's an expression. I will write this then in terms of the four wave mixing susceptibility, chi f at omega a is equal to n over 6m partial alpha with respect to x0 squared omega v squared minus omega laser minus omega anti-stokes squared plus i omega laser minus omega a times gamma. And if you compare this to an equation we had just a little while ago, this turns out to be just twice chi, just twice chi Raman at omega a. So the total polarization at omega A is given by the following. P of omega A is equal to 6 epsilon 0 chi Raman at omega A, A laser squared A A e to the I K A Z plus 3 epsilon 0 chi 4 wave mixing at omega A a laser squared, A Stokes star, e to the i twice K laser minus K Stokes times Z. So let's stare at this and admire it. Uh, This second term is what we would call a parametric term, but this first term is what we would call a non-parametric term. So you see there's, there's, there's some non-linear coupling that appears here that we have not encountered yet this semester. Uh, see, this is the modulus of A laser. This is A laser itself. Here, the phase, I've said this a dozen times, but it's worth saying it again. Here, the phase of the laser field does not matter because it's a squared modulus. Here, the phase of the laser field does matter. That's why this one has to be phase matched here, it's automatically phase matched. Uh, and similarly, there will be two contributions to the polarization at the Stokes frequency. So we can write P of omega Stokes is 6 epsilon 0 chi Raman at omega Stokes A laser squared A Stokes e to the chi Ks Z plus 3 epsilon zero chi four wave mixing at omega stokes a laser squared a a star e to the i 
twice k laser minus k a times z. And I guess we haven't defined this one yet. So chi four wave mixing at omega Stokes is just twice chi Raman at omega Stokes, which is chi four wave mixing at omega anti Stokes complex conjugate. You can check the uh, algebra if you want. Now, what would, you, what would you do if someone handed you two contributions to the nonlinear polarization? You would stuff them into the wave equation and derive coupled amplitude equations, right? So let's do that now. So I, we can write the coupled amplitude equations as dAs dz is equal to minus alpha s as plus kappa s a a star e to the i delta k z and dAa dz is equal to minus alpha a a a plus kappa a a Stokes star e to the plus i delta kz. I'll define these four quantities in a moment. This is the most general form in which two waves can interact with one another as they propagate in the near forward direction. Near forward direction, you know, something like K laser, K laser, K Stokes, K anti Stokes. You see, there's only four things that can happen. A sub s can couple to itself, it can couple to the other one. I've allowed arbitrary coefficients here, uh, and the same for the anti-stokes. It can couple to itself or it can couple to the other one. Uh, and of course, this is automatically phase matched because there's no way that a wave can get out of phase with itself, uh, but this one has a delta k dependence because there's no guarantee that the Stokes and the anti-Stokes will propagate with the same phase velocity. Question? Is it the same delta k? It's the same delta k because it is. Could you also rewrite alpha s as minus alpha a, write all of alpha s? Say that again? Uh, I'm, I'm just surprised that it was so symmetrical, but I think that when you... Well, it's not so symmetrical. I, I, because no one ever said that this is equal to this. Well, but you got it by switching the signs of omega L minus omega K minus B, right? Well, here's an expression for the polarization at the Stokes. Here's a polar uh, equation for the polarization at the anti-Stokes. Ah, I did not use this relation in deriving it. Wait, I haven't finished writing it. So, so I said, let me just tell you that uh, until I finish writing it, uh, uh, until I finish writing it, you can't, you, you have no ability to, to object to it because I haven't told you what it is yet. Okay, so here alpha j is minus 3i omega j over njc chi Raman at omega j a laser squared where J is equal to Stokes or anti-Stokes 
and kappa j is 3i omega j over twice n sub j c chi four wave mixing at omega j a laser squared. Again, j is equal to Stokes or anti Stokes. I use kappa for coupling. So this is a coupling coefficient. It couples one wave to the other. This is a generalized absorption coefficient. Question? What happens on the denominator in kappa? N and J? Oh, that's a two. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. But now, and delta K, that's what you were actually asking me about. This is delta K Z component. This is twice K laser minus K S minus K A. Okay. So I mean, that's why it's the same delta K. Delta K is symmetric between the Stokes and the anti-Stokes. I mean, that's what you mean by delta K. It's the mismatch between, it's the mismatch of the four-wave mixing process. So it has to depend symmetrically on, on both of those fields. Okay, so, yes? Well, I can tell you what I wrote. Uh, I, I'd want to think carefully before you hold me to this. I said it's the most general form of forward four-wave mixing. Maybe I should say near forward four-wave mixing. Or maybe I should say this is an incredibly general equation here. And we could all go home and think very carefully about, uh, about its generality. But I mean, this, I mean, here it is. You have four waves, uh, all propagating roughly in the forward direction. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, and, and this is pretty much the most general way that you could imagine them to be coupled to one another. So I said, if somebody gives you a nonlinear polarization, what do you do with it? You derive coupled wave equations. Now, someone gives you coupled wave equations, what do you do with them? You solve them. Now, the general solution to this is given in the book. Uh, I found it enormously satisfying for me to do this. Uh, if you find it enormously satisfying, you can read it. <laughs> but there's no need to do it in class. Uh, I mean, uh, you can do everything here. If, if delta K becomes very, very large, they decouple from one another. I mean, all the special cases, uh, if, if the absorption disappears, then one thing happens. Uh, I mean, uh, there's enormous richness here when you study all the special cases of it. Uh, But for our immediate interest, all we really need to do is solve it for the case of SRS. And for stimulated Raman scattering, uh, we said this already, that uh, these Absorption and coupling coefficients are related to one another in very simple ways. Uh, in, in very simple ways. So the solution I'm going to write down for you is the one that applies to uh, stimulated Raman scattering.
it's best to look at this as an eigenvalue problem. Uh, the uh, the eigenvectors is that a s is equal to some constant e to the g plus z plus c two e to the g minus z and a a equals c three e to the g plus z plus c4 e to the g minus z, where g plus or minus is equal to plus or minus the square root of i alpha s delta k minus delta k over 2 squared. So, I mean, that's why these are the eigenvalues, these are the eigenvectors. Uh, so you have one solution that grows, the plus sign, one that dies, the minus sign. These are both g plus. So these two are coupled together. So, so you have one linear combination of this and this, you have another one that's a linear combination of, of this and this. These, uh, the C1, C2, C3, D, C4, they depend on the initial conditions, but they also depend on the eigenvalue solution. You cannot choose this and this independently of one another. For, for a given value of G plus or G minus, there's a fixed ratio between the two. Of course, you only have two uh, initial conditions. So uh, let's see what this looks like then. So if you plot the real part of G, so the real part of G is the gain or the loss, and let's plot this as a function of delta K. You get something that looks like this. And I'll just draw a dashed line so that you know which solution, how the solutions are related to one another. So, well, just by convention, this is G plus and this is G minus. If you go through this, uh, if you go through this, the minus is the gain and the plus is the loss, but we can live with that. Uh, now, if you actually look at the eigenvectors, when delta k is equal to zero, it's a 50-50 mixture of Stokes with anti-Stokes. Asymptotically, when delta k is very large, the Stokes and the anti-Stokes decouple from one another this one becomes the Stokes wave, and this one here becomes the anti-Stokes wave. So when, they, when delta K is large, they are decoupled. The Stokes wave sees amplification. The anti-Stokes wave sees attenuation. When delta K is zero, you have such a strong coupling between the Stokes and the anti-Stokes that the attenuation of the anti-Stokes wave entirely balances the amplification of the Stokes wave and neither solution grows or dies. So this picture that I had on the board before of what this looks like if you look at it on a screen uh, tells you exactly that. For the exact phase matching condition, you get nothing. But then, as you go a little bit off of the phase matching condition, you get uh, some anti-Stokes. As you go far away, it's only Stokes. So actually, let's look at this phase matching condition a little bit more. So what is this phase matching condition really? Uh, so. K laser, K 
laser, K Stokes, K anti Stokes. So this would be the perfect phase matching condition. We call this angle theta. But you might ask yourself, does this really happen? De depending on the dispersion relation for the refractive index, you could imagine that maybe this does happen or that maybe this is impossible and it could not happen. So let's take a careful look at this and let's remind ourselves that if you plot the refractive index as a function of frequency, you get a curve that is concave upward. You do not get a curve that is concave downward. So, and this is crucial. It's because the second derivative is what it is that you are able to achieve phase matching. And let's see why. Let's say that this is the laser frequency. Let's say this is the Stokes frequency. Let's say that this is the anti-Stokes frequency. So now I'll join, now let me, let me draw the curve better to accentuate the point I want to make. Let's say you have a curve that looks like that. Let's say this is your laser frequency. This is your anti-Stokes frequency. This is your Stokes frequency. Let's connect this point with this point. And you see that the average of these two refractive indices is larger than this refractive index. So that means that the length of this vector plus the length of this vector is larger than twice the length of this vector here. Or if you plot them straight ahead, it means that you have something that looks like this. If you have a situation like that, maybe someone wants to tell me that it's time to stop the lecture and let the students go home. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you have this situation here, you, you can go off axis and have this, whereas yes, whereas if you had the opposite situation, I think we're done with this, if you had the opposite situation in which you had this plus this equals this, plus that, well, the laser is going in the forward direction. The Stokes and the anti-Stokes can go in different directions, so this one could lead to phase matching of this sort here, but this one here cannot. Okay, so uh, that is, that's it. What does Woody work better say? That's all, folks? <laughs> That one you understand, right? Okay, so, so are there any, uh, so let's just, uh, it's too late in the day to start a different topic. So this is the stimulated light scattering story. Now, let me ask if there's any discussion that you want to have. Yes? Uh, speaking of, I just want to understand about the last lecture, uh, which you told about the power broadening. Right. Okay. So, how do I say this? So, I'm not wrong. It was the previous instructor who was wrong. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, so, so uh, but the, the, the question is, how is, how is power broadening related to natural broadening? No, no, in the last no. lecture. Too much, not too much time in the upper layer. Right. And then decays down. 
Okay, let, let me erase the board and talk about that. Uh, can I erase this? With pleasure, right? So, let me write down the, the right equation, unless somebody has it right in front of them. Does anybody remember the exact expression for power broadening? Actually, let me write down the equation. Uh, uh, so, probably the best way, this is for a two-level atom. And what I said is that the imaginary part of the susceptibility at frequency omega can be written as alpha naught divided by omega over C times 1 over 1 plus omega squared T1 T. 2 times 1 over 1 plus omega minus omega b a squared times t 2 squared over 1 plus omega squared t 1 t 2. And now where omega squared is mu b a squared e squared over h bar squared. Let me see if there's a numerical factor. There is four. Okay, so this was the result. Uh, And so the, 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 the point is that uh, the line width is equal to 1 over T2. And because of that, the line width, uh, it's as if For natural broadening, that was a question. For, for natural broadening, the line width is just 1 over T2. Now, delta nu power broadening you see that this becomes the square root of 1 plus omega squared t1 t2 over t2. So delta nu plotted as a function of the laser intensity uh, goes like the square root of the intensity, so you know, something like that. So the line becomes broader as the intensity becomes larger. So first comment is we derived this. So, so unless somebody thinks there is a mistake in the derivation and in the derivation of at least 50 books 
published uh, since Felix Bloch derived this in 1940, we, th we think that the answer is right. But then the question is, is there an intuition? Can intuition help us understand this result? And I think this was the point I made, I was trying to make in lecture. So, uh, if you have a weak laser field, the atom decays to the ground state as e to the minus t over t2, where t2 is just the inverse of the Einstein A coefficient. Maybe a factor of two, I'm not sure. So uh, in, the, in the weak field, the atom stays in the upper level only for this amount of time. So the line width of the transition can be no narrower than this decay rate because of a Fourier relation. Uh, you cannot define this energy more accurately than the amount of time you have to make this measurement. Now, what about a strong field situation? Now, we didn't do it in lecture, but if you plot, let's call this A and this B, uh, and let's actually let V be the probability amplitude to be in the upper level. So if you plot the probability to be in the upper level as a function of time, you get something that looks like this, where it can be as much as one. And these are called Rabi oscillations. This is treated in the same chapter, but later on in the chapter. And now, if you do if you do this with an even stronger field, you find that v squared as a function of t is going to oscillate more rapidly. And this means that the atom will spend less time in the upper level before it's driven back to the lower level. And you can understand the fact that the line width is increasing by the fact that the time it spends in the upper level is reduced. Okay, so that was the insight I was trying to convey. Now, so did that answer your question? No, so, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a semantic point. You call it power broadening because it's a strong field. Okay, you're welcome. I want to thank you for asking. Okay, are there any more questions? You're thinking of asking a question. I could. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, oh, that was Brillouin scattering. Wait, uh, let me get the logic straight. I, I said that there are at least five different there's five different spontaneous scattering processes. Each one of these has a spontaneous analog and a stimulated analog. I'm sure nobody wanted me to lecture on all five of them, so we'll just pick one. And today we did Raman scattering. Uh, maybe it's technologically more important. Uh, I mean, Raman scattering happens whether you want it to or not. Uh, in optical fibers, uh, one of the origins of the spreading of a pulse, uh, in addition to uh, cell phase modulation, there's also Raman scattering, which generates light at different frequencies. Whenever you broaden a pulse, Whenever you broaden a pulse, that's good. 
at least if you're an ultra fast person. Because if you want to, if you want to make a very, very short pulse, you need a broad spectrum. So uh, Raman, uh, what do they call it? In an optical fiber, uh, doesn't matter what the word is. If you don't know this, this, this is maybe the, the only important thing I said today. Raman scattering in a molecular gas, the uh, Raman spectrum Here is omega laser, and the Raman spectrum will be a, a line at this point here. But if you do it in silica glass, because silica glass is glass, it's amorphous, the uh, Raman spectrum is so broad that it extends to the laser frequency itself. So Raman scattering will take the laser light and broaden it appreciably to the red. Uh, so this is a crucial issue for fiber nonlinear optics, that, that the, the Raman, Raman self-frequency shift is what they call it. So this is called the Raman self-frequency shift. As a pulse propagates through a fiber, it tends to move toward the red part of the spectrum. It is Raman scattering, but the, uh, the, the vibrational modes are, are not well defined. They are broadened out together because it's a, uh, it's a glassy medium, and that ri gives rise to this effect. But that wasn't your question. Your question was Brillouin scattering. So, so Brillouin uh, is scattering of light from sound waves. And uh, I've done a lot of work on that. But uh, uh, I just didn't feel like teaching it this year. Okay. Any, I mean, scattering, scattering, will re, uh, scattering will remove light from a beam. So I guess I wouldn't call it absorption. Sorry, very first level question. Are, are, are those terms the same? Do you know what you think that spontaneous emission? Oh, yeah, spontaneous emission. Um, no. Well, I think, I, I think the simplest thing to say is no that you have spontaneous emission and absorption, but you have spontaneous light scattering. So let, uh, let's see if we can... Uh, so absorption... is where you make a transition from a ground state to an excited state and the atoms in this excited state for at least some period of time. Scattering. Uh, I mean, the usual picture of scattering is that you are not tuned to the resonance. You, uh, you have a laser beam that is exciting some molecule. The molecule develops an oscillating dipole moment, and then an oscillating dipole moment will uh, radiate uh, in terms of a dipole pattern. Okay, so this is the traditional view of scattering. This is the traditional view of absorption. Now, these are different pictures, right? Uh, 
when you do this, there's some probability that the atom is actually in this upper level. Uh, and uh, when you do this, at least until a dephasing collision occurs, uh, there will be an induced dipole moment that will scatter. But, uh, but a dephasing collision can wipe out the oscillating dipole moment but still allow the population to be in the upper level. It's a, I mean, it's a very subtle question you're asking. It's a very subtle question, uh, but I think that's my best answer, is that uh, uh, we don't want to treat everything at every moment. So as a simplifying assumption, we say that absorption and scattering are two different processes. But it really would be very, very difficult to uh, to say, oh, there's no scattering going on now. This is just pure absorption. So we can all think about that. And, uh, that's my best answer for right now. Can you always need a seed for your theory? Ah. Uh, it, it, yeah, but it can be vacuum fluctuations. The seed can be quantum fluctuations. But it's the same question as, do you need a seed to start a laser? Uh, lasers seem to know how to turn themselves on <laughs> uh, without injecting light from the outside. Uh, so spontaneous emission uh, can be the physical process that initiates laser action. Well, stimulated... Spontaneous parametric scattering. I mean, that's what creates entangled photons. So there, there are nonlinear processes that will generate light. Uh, so I guess for the Raman case, so where does the first photon come from? I think you can ascribe this to uh, a vacuum effect. The, the quantum effect initiates the Raman scattering process. But this is another one I'd like to think hard about before making a final answer. There must be more questions. We're not close enough to the final exam, right? <laughs> the week before the final exam, suddenly everybody thinks of the questions they've been wanting to ask for the entire semester. Okay. We're done. See you next week.